Well, Pony, I'm going to tee you up to let you start things here because our next guest is uh, with you on Radio Row, very glamorous Radio Row in Southern California. Only the higher ups, the big time of all the big timers are out there. It's 33 degrees here in Pittsburgh. There's still snow on the ground. All I'm seeing is salt on my shoes when I walk anywhere. So uh, I'll let you take it away here from the glitz and glamour of Radio Row. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, uh, Football Night in America. He's got a new book out called Playmakers. And you drove up from the West Virginia barn to the Pittsburgh airport to get out here? Yes. 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 So you went by the Franco statue and the George Washington statue, and boom. I feel bad for George Washington. Father of the country, (laughs) completely ignored at the Pittsburgh airport. It's like, hey, who's this other guy next to Franco? Because it's all about Franco. It's it's my first time traveling since before the pandemic. I've been home for most of two years we had a family beach trip back during that little sliver there was a, there actually was a little sliver of time when the world was normal until the delta variant came along but uh yeah i ventured out of my cave and uh made the trek through chicago out here to la and been here for a few days and having a good time and this is my first time in the media center i used to live in this place super bowl week we've got to set up in the nfl experience which is like 10 minutes away by golf cart mm-hmm. but uh, it's kind of great to be back in here mike how about the riddick story that's been the big thing in Pittsburgh today, he interviews for the job. He played at Pitt. He's very close to the Pitt program. He's interviewed for other jobs. We're trying to figure out Tomlin's role in all of this. Is it a situation with, with Colbert leaving? He's pretty much going to be, you know, all three branches of government for the Steelers. Defensive coordinator, head coach, and general manager, Mike. But we've had this conversation before, Art Rooney. But we can never get a direct answer, Mike. I know, but that's because he doesn't. You know, you got to love Jerry Jones. He's willing to put his name on everything. There are plenty of owners out there, and I've been doing this long enough now that I I realized it, whether it's John Mara of the Giants, Jeffrey Lurie of the Eagles. There are plenty of owners who quietly keep a spoon in the stew, and they stir it on their own terms. And if it goes poorly, it ain't their fault. And I, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination is art hiding but i think he's a lot more involved in decisions than than they would ever announce to the world okay so i still think that that he's going to be whoever the gm is has to recognize that art is still going to be very present and very involved it's the family business it's been the family business the way they've always done it it's just in a different time now where if you're an owner who's perceived to be meddling that's a bad thing well it's your football team it's your family's football team it's your legacy it's your living legacy from your grandfather to your father of course you're going to be involved Mm -hmm. but i think they don't like to put it out there front and center because that's the quickest way to get criticized for everything that goes wrong mike do you think that lewis riddick or that a any of these outside candidates they've talked to has a realistic shot at succeeding kevin colbert because that's the other thing that that has sort of dominated this gm search is is i think in pittsburgh the assumption that it's going to be somebody who's already within the house, so to speak. Well, think about this. We've known that Kevin Colbert, one of these years, as he's gone year to year for, what, three or four years now, was going to pull the plug and step away. And my guess is that Art Rooney and Mike Tomlin and the rest of the organization knew, well before the rest of us knew, that this was going to be it for Kevin Colbert. So any responsible business is going to have a succession plan. And... I understand that, especially post the Brian Flores lawsuit, there's going to be an emphasis on having open and inclusive and diverse and and not already predetermined job searches. Mm-hmm. But if you're the Steelers and you know this is coming and you know who you have in your building and you've hired up people that you've had a chance to see them work and see them operate and you get along with them, it it just makes sense to elevate somebody from within the operation into Kevin Colbert's job because that person's been there to see how it works and they know him and he knows them. And, and, and so I'd be surprised just like with the saints, you know, the saints talk to people outside the organization after Sean Payton resigns, Dennis Allen's there. Dennis Allen's been there. Dennis Allen got to be the head coach for a game and shut out Tom Brady. And he's done a great job with the defense. How do you not, how do you not elevate somebody who's been there, who you know, who's comfortable with you, and you're comfortable with them? So it's great opportunity for these outside names. So like Lewis Riddick hadn't been interviewed for any of the other GM vacancies this year. I thought the window had closed on him. So okay. he's trending on Twitter today for a while. It's a little bump for him. But I'd be surprised if they go outside the organization to fill this job.
I like it. Well, Mike, this is uh, Arthur Motes here, and I wanted to say, fan of your work also. But um, wow, thank you, Arthur. Absolutely, no, absolutely, man. But um, talking about those candidates, right? The two in-house guys, Brandon Hunt and uh, Omar Khan, and obviously Lewis Riddick as well. From your perspective, how would you rank those three guys in terms of their candidacy for a GM position? You know, that's a great question, and I've learned that anytime anyone says that's a great question, it means they don't have an answer and they're trying to buy some time. <laughs> I, 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 always, I always defer to the people who have to live with the, de the decision uh -huh. and live with the results. And, and I look at it this way. If you're going to hire somebody and you're going to entrust them with that title and with those responsibilities, then – then the, you, you find the one that you feel the most comfortable with. And, you know, Omar Khan is a name that has bounced around in circles as a potential GM. He's had some interviews. There was always a thought that if Bill Cower ever coached again, Omar Khan is the first guy that Bill Cower would have would have poached out of the organization to be his general manager. And he's definitely paid his dues. And, and I know it's about putting the best team together, but there's something to be said for – long and loyal and trustworthy service and understands how we do things and understands what our systems are and isn't going to be a guy that is trying to soak up all the attention. Kevin Colbert wasn't that way. Omar Khan isn't that way. It's just kind of the way the Steelers do things. It's a very mm -hmm. understated approach to an overstated brand. And uh, I, I think that's going to be the key. It's going to be more about fitting within the way that Art Rooney and company do things and so they can continue – the train rolling the way that it has been for all these years, where far more often than not they're successful. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk, Football Night in America, the Super Bowl on Sunday, and his new book, Playmakers, which we'll get to in a second. Who is the most realistic veteran quarterback option for the Steelers, Mike? Realistic. I'm going to emphasize that word. Realistic guy for them from the outside to come in and be their quarterback. What do you mean by realistic? Like real person, they're all real people. Like you know the Steelers. There's no Shane so, Falco. You know the Steelers so well. They're not going to trade. <laughs> they're not going to trade three ones for Aaron Rodgers. I want them to, but they won't do that. That's not who the Steelers are. They've never been that type of splashy team. I don't disagree with that. And I don't know. Is it going to take three ones to get Aaron Rodgers? Would it? I, a two-time defending MVP. His team. It's almost like they were too successful this year. You almost needed him to dip a little bit to maybe drop the price tag that they would have expected. I, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo makes sense, doesn't he? He'd be an upgrade over Mason That's Rudolph. That's $27 million cap hit, Mike, in yeah, one year. Yeah, he'd have to do a new deal. He'd have to do a new deal. That's the key. You can't just take on his contract. You have to say, all right, Jimmy, we're going to give you a chance to come be the starter. You're not going to have a Trey Lance constantly hovering over you. We're comfortable with you running our offense. And we got to do a deal that's more realistic to the market right but now. But another good team fit. said, we can't win a Super Bowl with this guy. And then you take him on, Mike? I mean. Well, but they got to a Super Bowl with him. Yeah. It's all about where your expectations are relative to but where you But should the Steelers are. have sky high expectations? Well. Six Lombardis. Oh, I know. The but, standard is the standard. But they haven't been to the Super Bowl more than 10 years. Correct. You know, it's funny. We give the Packers a hard time. Hey, you haven't been to the Super Bowl more than 10 years. With the Steelers, it's kind of like nobody gets worked up about it. Not, not that I'm saying they should. It's just kind of a weird. Well, I do. It's kind of a weird, I don't know, it's like benefit of the doubt that the Steelers get. And they're always in the conversation. You know, with the Steelers, p people say, oh, isn't it impressive they've had three coaches since 1969? Well, when you never really suck, it's, it's easier to not change coaches. If they had gone through a period like they did in the 50s and 60s, they'd be changing coaches every other year. But you, your success leads to stability, and your stability leads to success, and they've figured out the formula. But, you know, this is a crossroads for them. It was a, it was a long 20 years between Bradshaw and Roethlisberger. And somehow they were a competitive team with a revolving door of guys who were not high-end quarterbacks. And I really wouldn't want to go back to that if I were them. I would want a short-term Band-Aid veteran while I try to find my next franchise quarterback who's going to be here in Pittsburgh 15 to 20 years. Mike, one of the other things that they seem to take pride in, whether they say it publicly or not, is the no losing seasons under Tomlin, no losing season since Roethlisberger got here, tank or you know have a horrible year is not really in this team's vocabulary. And yet, given everything you just said to me, there is virtue. You want to find that next quarterback, that next Ben Roethlisberger type, your best chance is to go 6-11 and 11 next year or worse and have a great crack at one of that crop that's supposed to be very good with maybe Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud. What do you overall make of this philosophy of we are we are going to try like hell as an organization to basically never stink up the joint in any given year? I mean, I, I, I like it because I believe – now, look, every owner 
every GM, every coach is programmed to say our goal is to win the Super Bowl every single year. And really, if that's how you determine your success as an operation, you're going to be pissed off all the time. <laughs> I mean, even the Patriots at their best, they failed two out of three years on average. Right. So it's about, I think, it's, and, and I've seen some reporting out of Pittsburgh about local viewership numbers, the stadium attendance. You know, it's about being very relevant into Christmas and New Year's. You want to be alive. You want to be very alive. You want to be ideally in the hunt for the one seed, but you want to have a team that every year is still going and people have a reason to show up for the games and people have a reason to watch the games. And I really think that the, the decline in viewership numbers, I think I saw this in the Tribune Review, like a 10% decline in viewership numbers this year. That's kind of alarming. You don't expect that. That's not Steeler-ish. And it, it's, it speaks to the wisdom of maybe – going fishing for a big name like Aaron Rodgers. You want to inject some excitement. But, again, it goes so against what they do. Right. But I, but I, I, I think they never want to consciously take a step back. You're never going to see a plan like they had in Cleveland where they prioritize everything but winning. We want to save cap space. We want to <laughs> stockpile draft picks. We have all these factors that – when you look at them collectively, yeah, we don't give a crap about winning football games. The Steelers are never going to be that way. Every year they're going to look at 0-0 zero and zero as a chance to start a climb that ends at the top of the mountain with Super Bowl championship number seven. For good or bad, for better or worse, every year that's the climb that they're going to try to make. Now, Mike, we've talked about the franchise quarterback and we're searching for that guy, but we also know that the team typically likes to build through the draft. With that being said, with the current state of the Steelers, do you feel like it's conducive for one of the rookie quarterbacks in this year's draft to be able to come in and have success early on? Or do you think that with the current status, coordinator included, that this probably isn't the best case for one of those younger players coming in this season? We see these younger guys, Arthur, though, coming in right away. Right away. That's what makes it so jarring that the 49ers made the big move from 12 to 3. Yep. And it seems like something wasn't right with Trey Lance. He wasn't ready. He needs to sit a whole year. Maybe he needs to sit two years. Today, we are seeing guys come in because what teams are doing, they are looking at what these players did in their college offenses, and they're adapting their offenses to fit what the guy's already done well. And it took like 50 years for coaches <laughs> to figure that out. It's like, hey, you know what? This makes sense. We fell in love with this guy because of what he did in college. Let's do what he did in college, and he's going to make a smoother transition to the NFL. So the, the Mississippi quarterback that got hurt Corral. in the bowl game, I mean, you know, maybe you get lucky and he slips down for I, what was the the final diagnosis on him? I've been in a blender ever since that game. No, he, I think he tear an ACL. Is no, he going to drop think or he's okay? okay? I think he's going to stay where he the is. The other side of the coin is this, though, and we've seen the Steelers do it with Troy Polamalu. We saw him do it with Santonio Holmes. We saw him do it with Devin Bush. The willingness, if there's a guy they want, they're going to spring up. They're going to give up the assets to jump up and get a guy. And so, it worked in two out of those three right. cases. Right. Well, that's hey. When you're talking about the draft, if you're batting two out of three, that's pretty damn good. But <laughs> yeah. when you make a move up, it, it raises right. the stakes. But but we've seen that there are times where they have a guy they like, he falls into range, and they go get him. And I, I think that's a possibility as well. The question becomes what resources do you put on the table to go get a guy? But they, they just need – look, tw I don't know how they got to a Super Bowl with Neil O'Donnell in hindsight. It's because the defense was so damn good. No no disrespect intended to Neil O'Donnell, but you, you need a franchise quarterback to really be a high-end team on a regular basis. And they lived those two decades, whether it was Neil O'Donnell or Mike Tomzak or Cordell Stewart. or you know, It never was where it was when Bradshaw was at his best and Roethlisberger was at his best, and, and, and that's the most important position on the field, and that's, that's where they have to find a long-term answer. Any veteran they find would presumably be – you know, a quick fix while, hey, we got to figure out where that rookie is going to line up with our spot in the draft, and we can either go up and get him or he's going to land in our laps, but this is going to be the guy that becomes our next in the line of Bradshaw and Roethlisberger. Mike, when did you launch Pro Football Talk? 20 November years ago? November 1, 2001. Okay. So in that time, more than 20 years, I feel like in Pittsburgh, the story that you had that got the most traction was the thing about the minority ownership in Mike Tomlin, that there was – among that group, they were not very pleased at the time. What was that, two or three years ago with the job Tomlin was doing? There was some. It was after one of the playoff losses. It was the year the year that. Jacksonville, maybe, they lost that game. It may have been that year. Blake it, Bortles. It was, it was just. Yeah, the, what happens is, and, and there's a weird dynamic in the fan base. And I got friends who have been lifelong Steelers fans. And anytime there's any type of adversity that hits the team, it all goes back to Tomlin. Got to get a new coach. Like, really? The minute that Mike Tomlin would be fired, there would there's another team. I'm sure there's another team out there that would fire its coach on the spot. 
to yeah. get Mike Tomlin. But I go ahead, that. but go ahead, fire Mike Tomlin if that's what you want. But but there's that groundswell, and and I know that the reliable sources, as opposed to the unreliable sources, I rely upon. But in this case, it was reliable sources that that uh, there were there were folks in the the limited partnership, the minority owners, who wanted to make a change. And, and Art Rooney is never going to listen to those folks. But the fact is, they they were not happy, and they wanted a change to be made. And you know, I think it's for the good of the team for Mike Tomlin to still be there. I, you just don't take Mike Tomlin for granted. He's one of the best coaches in the NFL. When guys leave and go to other teams and other coaches realize what a pain in the ass that guy is, they're like, how did Mike Tomlin keep this? <laughs> and Antonio Brown's just one of many. How did Mike Tomlin get the most out of this guy? I can't. I can't get him to pay attention. I can't get him to do anything. Mike Tomlin's got the magic touch where he can get guys – motivated and focused and he gets more out of a team collectively than the quality of the players individually would suggest what would be the best part of your new book for Steelers fans they go by playmakers in a month okay what's the thing that you want to let them know about that is going to be a page turner for them Mike wow I'm reminded of when I interviewed Rob Gronkowski when his book came out a few years ago and I said Rob now's the chance for you to tell everyone why they should go buy your book and he said, that's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is hilarious. So um, I, there isn't any. That really happened on the yes, air? Yes, yes, oh live. God. I there mean, that's right on once. That's on brand for him, though. That's, I feel like yeah, that would totally, totally helped him. Totally on brand. That's a good question. You know, in that voice, <laughs> oh, I'm special. That's a good question. I don't know. And I, at the risk of sounding like Rob Gronkowski, there really isn't any one Steelers-related story that I can think of. Uh -huh. Like with the Patriots, there's every Spygate story. We dropped some of the stuff about Deflategate that set Boston media ablaze yesterday, and I gladly lit that fire and ran. Like with fireworks, light <laughs> I love fuse and get away. <laughs> I love doing that, Mike. I'm trying to sell books. Somebody's giving me a hard time about it. It's like, hey, shut up. I'm trying to sell books, Mike, baby. you should have Pony I mean, promote gonna, the I'm book on Twitter. It. You got to have Pony. <laughs> Pony is. I have worked with a lot of people in this business who can fire people up. Pony's ability to get people to go literally insane on yes. Twitter is unmatched. You should. Yeah, you you pay story, him Mike. for like Twitter promotion of that book. People will buy it just because they hate him so much on there. Trust me. Trust me. I have a little bit of that skill too, and only about forty percent of the time is it intentional. That's the problem. It's a great power if you can harness it. But 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 look, it, it's a twenty-year look at the NFL, and I know that in Pittsburgh there are passionate football fans, passionate NFL fans. I grew up sixty miles away, and it was all Steelers all the time. And the moment that I realized the NFL was a big deal was the moment Frank O'Harris caught that ball and ran to the end zone. We lived in an area where, you know, back in 1972, and this really sounds like a long time ago, I guess because it was, but um, they blacked out games even if they were sold out. So we were They had the never one, won a playoff game. We were, we were the uh, one house in the neighborhood that had that game on TV. Nobody else could get it. So wow. all the grown-ups were in the house. I'm seven years old playing with my Hot Wheels, and that moment happens, and everybody loses their mind. And I'm thinking – this NFL, this must be a pretty big deal. But I know how people feel about the NFL, and it's a great history lesson over the last 20 years in the NFL. All the stories that you either knew about, you forgot about, you never knew about, wrinkles you didn't know about, and how it all kind of fits together to create a league that somehow continues to make money, even if it's trying not to, <laughs> even if it's shooting itself in the foot. Yeah. It's still a product that we can't get enough of. It's an amazing story, and I wonder at times how much bigger it would be if it was run properly top to bottom. But even with a lot of bad decisions, and we've seen a lot of them in the last week, whether it's Brian Flores, the allegation about Stephen Ross offering $100,000 to lose games, the stuff that's happening with the Washington team, but they still keep generating ratings like nothing else can and money like no other sports product can. Playmakers March 15th, Mike? March fifteenth. Order it now. And I'm telling you, and here's this is this is the truth. Unlike all the lies I've told for the last twenty minutes, this one's the truth. <laughs> to be truthful, I always hate that when someone says to be honest. No, say to be candid. Anytime you say to be honest, it implies that the rest of the time you're lying. So to be candid. That's the lawyer in you coming out. So right to now. be candid, they had to order five thousand more last week. They had to order four thousand more this week. So we're going to need a bigger boat. Order it now because you may have to wait. You may have to wait longer than March 15 if you wait too long. So order it now. And we'll watch you Sunday for sure, Mike. Thanks so much, man. Thanks. Great Appreciate talking to you guys. It. Good luck to you. Yep.